It is a scenario that Western sanctions against the Kremlin were intended to avoid. Nevertheless, Russian cruise missiles causing death and destruction in Ukraine apparently contain semiconductors from Western companies, like German ship giant Infineon. That is the result of research by the D German daily Frankfurter Allgemeine. The company, Infineon, regrets this but sees others as responsible for the deliveries. One of the deadliest weapons in Russia's war against Ukraine is the KH-101 missile. Nicknamed Kodiak by NATO, it travels up to 900 kilometers per hour and can carry 450 kilos of explosives. None of its destructive targeting capability would be possible without its powerful semiconductor chip, which in the case of Kodiak is produced by German electronics giant Infineon and its American subsidiary Cyprus. That's despite U.S. and EU sanctions against Russia. Sanctions experts say the chips are ending up in Russian hands through a long chain of intermediaries, most of which are based in China, Vietnam and the Philippines. And although chip producers are claiming that long supply chains make tracking their product difficult, experts have proven that it's in fact very easy, using readily available international customs data. A simple routine inspection turned up delivery of 150,000 chips and showed an increase in purchases from individual Russian buyers, which they say should be massive red flags. Let's get more on this uh, from Erland Bjordvet. He is the head of the consulting firm CoRisk and he investigates violations of the applicable Russian sanctions on behalf of the Norwegian Helsinki Committee, a non-governmental human rights watchdog. Welcome to DW, Erland. Now, with tens of thousands of chips appearing in Russian uh, rockets despite the sanctions on their export, how do you think these chips are getting in? Well, we know quite a lot about that, actually. Uh, they um, generally come in via Asia, mostly. I would reckon 80, maybe even 90% of the chips come in via Asia. Uh, China, Hong Kong, uh, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, and other countries. Uh, partly because much of the chips are produced in Asia, uh, but also chips produced in Europe and the United States uh, itself uh, generally comes into Russia via uh, traders in Asia, a little bit via Turkey and other Middle Eastern countries. And a very, very small amount actually comes in from directly from EU members. Uh, but that's a very small amount. Mm. Um, tell us more about these, these uh, supply chains. I mean, what is the route that these chips are taking from their producer until they end up in Russia? Well, uh, much of them are actually are, sh are sh shipped by plane. So they arrive at uh, airports, uh, mostly in Russia. Uh, many of the Russian importers, say importers uh, that supply uh, the Russian military industry, which is of great importance here, they often have like one or perhaps two main suppliers in Asia. That could be a supplier in China, could be a supplier in Malaysia. Uh, and many of these suppliers uh, may supply up to 40, 50% uh, for the relevant Russian military-linked importer. Uh, they generally, uh, wherever they are uh, produced, the microchips and circuits and other components, uh, they may take a quite complex supply chain route, uh, often ending up in China or Hong Kong, and then being skipped mostly by plane. So these components, of course, they are very light, they are not very heavy, and they are not very big in volume as well. So it pays off to, to, to ship them uh, by air, and it's uh, not so easy to control that, uh, that trade, actually, physically. So this is an oversight issue, is it not? This is an oversight issue. Uh, it is actually not so difficult to track this uh, trade. Because the Russians themselves, they share their uh, uh, data, actually. It is uh, fully uh, possible and legal to retrieve those uh, customs data. And uh, the data contain the trade in detail. 
So basically, we can track uh, the components. We can see who produced them. We can see uh, who uh, shipped them to Russia. We can see who in we can the individual who took them out of customs in Moscow, St. Petersburg, or elsewhere. Mm. So we can uh, see quite a lot of what's going on. And the volumes are massive. And I think both uh, investigators, customs, police, and other authorities, and of course, the producing companies themselves should clearly monitor and understand the pattern of these uh, trades. So Erland, if the data is there, if uh, these sales, if the route that these chips are taking can be tracked, why isn't there done more to stop these circumventing these sanctions? This is a very good question. Uh, I have the notion that some customs and police authorities in the Western world are maybe a bit behind. It may be a question of resources or priority, but it also may be a question of actually uh, getting access to the to the right data. So uh, the customs data in detail for Russian import, they are absolutely available. It is possible to uh, acquire them directly and to monitor this in a quite effective way. Uh, unfortunately, we don't think that is always being done. And uh, that is something that should be easy to fix from the Western side. Uh, let's take a look at the uh, producers here. Among them, uh, obviously, the, the big German chips producer, uh, Infineon. Um, do you believe that these companies are actively trying to get around sanctions and rules, or are they acting in good faith and then their products are being abused? That's a very good question. And of course, it's uh, difficult to answer because the producers would have to answer that themselves. But we can see some patterns, of course, in the trade. When we look at the data, and we are talking about data on trade worth hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for all of the digital component producers, we do see that uh, there is a kind of consistency in some of the trade. For example, there are a few Russian importers taking up a lot of the imports. There are a few Asian traders facilitating a lot of the trade. And such mm. big uh, uh, patterns and such red flags, so to say, I think should have been seen. Uh, it is not so difficult for big companies, if they employ the right resources internally, to actually uh, identify, detect, and see this trade going on. Uh, and it is possible uh, to really kind of monitor this over time and see if the producer, for example, could uh, take some measures towards um, traders, uh, middlemen, uh, retail, uh, etc. Erland, you mentioned it there. Uh, Asian nations are among the prime sanctions uh, busters here. China, Vietnam, the Philippines, to name a few. Um, could this have broader implications for trade relations? Uh, I doubt that uh, because, after all, the sanctions of Russia are Western sanctions. They are not uh, general uh, global sanctions. They are not UN sanctions. Uh, even though the United States have a, a record of employing what we call uh, secondary sanctions, so they sanction the companies that don't sanction, even if those companies are Chinese or whatever, uh, that is not uh, the pattern in Europe. Uh, we don't have a record uh, to do that in Europe. And I don't think that will be done in this case neither. Uh, I think Western producers, the primary producers of uh, the digital components, they will have to fix this themselves. They'll have to turn the spotlight on the producers, on their due diligence, on the measures they are taking actually to control the routes and the ways of their own products. Mm. So the supply chain uh, that uh, involve the products, of course, are, at the end of the day, they are uh, the liability and responsibility of the producers themselves. 
Erland Björdvet, head of consulting firm CoRisk. Erland, thank you for your thoughts. Thank you.